All right, continuing with um, our journey into proteins. So a little bit about protein structure. We talked about um, how proteins are made. A little about, about their structure that we need to know. So proteins, uh, amino acids make proteins, and they're joined by peptide bonds. But all amino acids have the same basic structure. So they all have an amino group, uh, which we're going to call this the N-terminus. Right, so because uh, it has a nitrogen on the terminal end or the end, and so this over here would be the C terminus. Right, so they all have this uh, amino group, this NH2, and this carboxyl group, uh, the COOH. Um, so amino group is. An H2 and a car carboxyl group COOH. You'll often see them written like that. Um, and then the R chain right here, so this is the alpha carbon, the middle one, and the side chain, uh, this is what they call the functional group. So they all have this structure. And if you look at here, so an example of a functional group, so leucine, so at this R would have. Uh, the CH2, the CH, and the two methyl groups on the outside, right? And threonine uh, would have an aspirin. So all of the different amino acids, all 20 of them, have different R groups that make it different functional. And these R groups make them uh, either nonpolar or polar, acidic or basic. And all of those characteristics uh, kind of create that spontaneous folding, right? A lot of times the Nonpolar groups will be located on the inside of the protein and the polar on the outside because all of these proteins are in this aqueous environment that's inside organisms. Okay, so that's a basic, and because of that basic structure, uh, they're able to make peptide bonds, right? So all of these bonds, all these peptide bonds, are formed via dehydration synthesis. If you think back to biology, if you can remember that long ago, Right? All the macromolecules we form essentially by this way. And when we talked about uh, making phosphodiester bonds in DNA, right? anywhere I have a hydroxyl, right? I can do dehydration synthesis, and I can form um, uh, a bond. So here I've got the C terminus on the amino acid 1, and the N terminus on amino acid 2. And I have a hydroxyl group here. And so since I have a hydroxyl group, I just have to find a hydrogen, something else. So if I have that and I have a hydrogen on another one, then through dehydration synthesis, I can release a water molecule, right? And I can form a bond, right? So that's essentially what, what happens there. And all of this happens doesn't happen spontaneously, but all this happens under the direction of enzymes, right? So enzymes uh, work by, by a couple different um, uh, mechanisms. Uh, they, either hold, um, they either hold the substrates, right? So each of these amino acid 1 and amino acid 2 would be a substrate. The substrate's in the correct position, right? And because they hold them in the correct position, they lower the energy necessary to keep them knocking into each other until they can form a bond, right? So uh, know that here, um, like I told you, right, the N terminus attaches to the C terminus of the next one, right? So four levels of protein structure, <clears throat> right? Primary, and a lot of times we'll go primary, secondary, tertiary. So <clears throat> that little uh, circle is kind of how we signify that. Okay, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. So primary, um, the primary structure is a polypeptide. So remember we said um, last 
Now, translation <clears throat> doesn't make functional proteins. Translation makes polypeptides. So that's a primary structure of amino acids. Right. The next structure, the secondary structure, right, will be a alpha helix. Where my pen keeps wrapping on here. Or a beta pleat. So this is through spontaneous folding. So this is from translation. And this is through spontaneous folding, right? Through spontaneous folding. Um, hydrogen bonds, right? So uh, I might have uh, sulfur hydro bonds as well. Uh, my tertiary right my tertiary structure um, is my 3D conformation. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my pen to work. I'm going to get a new battery. Hold on. So that's a 3D conformation. And so that could be with. The eight of chaperonins, we talked about those, specialized proteins. Um, this could add more hydrogen bonds. Sulfur hydro bonds. Right, Vander. Interaction, if you remember back to chemistry, right? Uh, could be due to hydrophobic interactions. So there's a lot that goes into the 3D confirmation or which aids it. So if you look at this picture here, Right, so I've got my, oops, I've got my peptide, my polypeptide is this chain right here, right? Uh, I've got a positive and negative side chains. It says ionic bond, but that's really um, uh, a van der Waals interaction, right? I've got a disulfide bond here. I got two sulfurs together, right? That's a pretty strong bond. Um, I've got methyl here, so these are more van der Waals. These are hydrophobic interactions. Right? I got acidic and basic side chains that attract each other as well. So there's a lot of different things going on that make that 3D structure possible. And then I have um, a quaternary structure, right? And that's two or more. Tertiary proteins. Um, the example that always comes uh, so hemoglobin is an example of a quaternary protein that always shows up uh, and there are um, four protein units so it's Four tertiary proteins kind of stuck together in a three-dimensional shape. All right. So the important thing here um, is 
right here, the tertiary structure is a functional protein, right? So a functional protein must at least have a tertiary structure. All right. So that tertiary structure gives proteins their function. So enzymes, remember, a little review here. So enzymes catalyze reactions by lowering activation energy, right? In the conformation, right, sets up what's called the active site. And that active site specifically fits a substrate, and a substrate is another word for reactant. So in biology, um, those substrates fit perfectly, and they can only fit in one direction, and then catalyze by moving them together so they can form those bonds like hydrogen bonds, right? Or do dehydration synthesis. Once a product is formed, it's released, and the enzyme is free to bind again, okay? So we say that it works like a lock and key. Right. So alteration of the site, so I can turn enzymes on and off by altering the site, right? So changes in temperature or pH, right, um, causes a process called denaturation. So it changes the size or shape of active sites so they don't fit anymore. So if you look here at this uh, picture down here, you've got that green enzyme that fits its substrates. Um, but when... Uh, it's inactivated, those active sites change, right? Those, when those active sites change, uh, then it no longer fits. So that's called allosteric regulation. So you can have an activator or an inhibitor. Um, so binding of a molecule to a regular site uh, causes allosteric activation or inhibition. So allosteric activation Another way to look at it, an allosteric activation, a molecule in a pathway. So if it's a sugar that needs to be digested, that sugar will plug itself in and change the active sites to fit a more substrate and make a product. Inhibition usually is a product um, attaches. And changes the shape so the product then binds uh, to that site and it changes the shape so it makes no more product. So this is called negative feedback, right? So negative feedback um, is a common way that uh, biological uh, organisms uh, regulate themselves. So we don't want a positive feedback loop often because you don't want a product to make more product because then it's a non-ending pathway. For, but negative inhibition, right? Um, is when the product of a pathway turns off the pathway. And then when there's not enough product, it turns back on again. Right? So that's uh, mostly how we do things. Uh, proteins and biotechnology, we said yesterday, or last time we talked, that uh, proteins are, are super important. Right? Proteins are probably the number one target um, of biotechnology. It's the production of proteins for a certain function. So some um, some distinct classes of proteins, right? We have nucleases, right? So restriction enzymes are actually restriction endonucleases, right? Uh, we can have restriction exonucleases or ribonucleases. So nucleases would be like restriction enzymes. 
um, DNA modifiers like polymerases, reverse transcriptase, um, things that we've talked about. Um, so these are the big ones we've talked about. Uh, restriction enzymes we've talked about there. And DNA ligases, right? So those three classes, but it could be more than that, right? So uh, we got polymerases, uh, restriction enzymes, uh, ligases. Um, we got antibodies, right? Uh, we'll talk about those next chapter in chapter eight. Uh, and then molecular ladders. Remember, we use those for quantification, right? And we have molecular ladders for protein size, too. We'll talk about um, page um, probably in the next meeting or the meeting after that. So uh, different ones that are important. Uh, make sure you know uh, the category. Uh, restriction enzymes are in nucleases. Uh, polymerases and transcriptase, those are in DNA mod modifiers. All right, but there are other things too. We have, as far as enzymes go, we have lipases, proteases, amylases, cellulases. Um, so if you think about all of these things, uh, and it's not necessary to, to memorize this chart, but if we look at all of these different things, pharmaceutical, research and development, diagnostics, uh, to make more catalysts in the food and beverage industry. Um, I know this is a 2010 market value, but it just shows you there's so much of everything um, that biotechnology produces proteins for. Right. So we'll start to, to talk a little bit about protein analysis. Um, first, we can quantify. So protein analysis. Um, first category is protein quantification. Uh, our old friend spectrophotometry um, uses absorbance of light in something that's called um, Beer's Law, right, to talk about it. And, and hopefully we'll get to do some of that because we're coming back to school. And then colorimetric assays, they use color change to predict concentration. So it's either the absorbance of light or the distinct color change, right? And then we'll talk about those a little more. But remember spectrophotometry. So spectrophotometry uh, uses uh, what's called Beer's Light and Beer's or Beer's Law. And Beer's Law says the amount of absorbance is directly related to the concentration of a protein, right? So if I shine a light, if I'm shining a light through, and I get 50% transmittance, and I shine another light through, and I get 25% transmission, right? The one with 25% trans transmission is twice as concentrated as 50% transmission, right? Because the other one absorbed twice as much light, right? So light absorbance is directly related to concentration. Uh, absorbance is inverse to transmittance. So, so uh, we can set our, our spectrophotometers up different ways. Um, absorbance. transmittance. And we'll find that, you know, we have different wavelengths in our spectrophotometer um, and different, uh, or different wavelengths are associated with um, different uh, molecules and con content. So if we think about down here at 260, so this is UV, right, at 260 nanometers, um, is the absorbance spectrum for DNA, which is super important because it'll be on your final exam. All right, so we can do that for different things. Uh, equipment, so a spectrophotometer, uh, a cuvette is what I put a sample in, All right? Types of spectrophotometry. Um, well, we can do a burette test. That's the oldest method of protein quantification. Uh, if it's Purple, it's positive. It's blue, it's negative. So it just turns purple um, in the presence of protein, right? Uh, although it absorbs light at 540 nanometers, it's not accurate for quantification because it's just if it's purple, it's positive, right? So we have Lowry and Bradford assay, right? And those are what are called colorimetric. So um, these are colorimetric. Uh, the Lowry goes from dark blue to light blue, right? Um, 
don't necessarily need to know that it uses a copper ion, uh, but the Lowry uh, changes color of blue, where the Bradford changes different color, right? So uh, less concentrated to the brown, more concentrated to the blue. So, and that's about it. Okay, so I'll talk to you in a bit. And bye for now.